I'm Mark Boris and this is Straight Talk. Brittany Saunders, welcome to Straight Talk. Thanks for having me. Hey guys, Brittany Lee Saunders. When I was in high school, this website came out called YouTube. I've actually thrown in my job. I'm now dedicating 100% of my time to making videos. I was so naive and clueless. Throughout my early 20s, that's when my social media really catapulted into something bigger than I ever could have imagined. I'd been doing YouTube for a while and I realised that it wasn't everything that I wanted to do. I began to feel like I was flogging a dead horse. Bit of a sellout. Yeah. yeah. Hi, I'm Brittany and this is Behind the Brand with Fate. We are Fate the Label, Staple Swim, Form Active and so much more than just that. I wake up every day and I'm so excited to go to work. It's interesting being in business because you almost get this feeling of never being really satisfied, no matter what you're doing online. If you're putting yourself out there, people are gonna have an opinion. But if I had ever at any point throughout my entire online career worried about what people had to say about me or let them get in my way, I'd be nowhere. Brittany Saunders, welcome to Straight Talk. Thanks for having me. Yeah, welcome. So all the way from Newcastle. Yeah. Newcastle girl. Two hours down the road. Yeah, two hours. Oh, is it really two hours? Well, depending on traffic, it might be two and a half. Yeah. If there's a crash, it might be three. Yeah, or six. Yeah. If there's a crash. Yeah. Yeah, yes, it can be totally. So, but, but you live in Newcastle, but yep. you've got businesses in, in Sydney. Yep. So how do you manage that? Really good managers. Yeah, you have really good managers. Yeah, within yeah. my team. I couldn't run my businesses without the people that are in it. Um, it was a business that I obviously started by myself but have just grown over the years and now I couldn't do it without the people that are helping me run it. I was talking to someone this morning about how you build brands um, and I want to talk to you about brand building. Mm -hmm. Build a brand and sell a product is probably, you know, at the end of the day where everybody wants to go because there's no point building a brand unless you can make some money out of it. And there's lots of ways to make money out of building a brand too. But one way to do it is build a brand, build an audience uh, that like you for whatever the reason is and then you sell them something that makes sense. I want to go through with you how the Brittany Saunders brand was built. You were only pretty young when you kicked it off. Yes. Tell me about that. When I was in high school, this website came out called YouTube and I discovered it and it was before anything was the way that it is now. How did you discover YouTube? I was on the computer at home a yeah. lot. Yeah. I don't know. I stumbled across it, saw that there was a few people um, making these videos on there. And ever since I was a little kid, I had always had a knack for entertaining. Uh, I, f I feel like I'm a natural entertainer. I was that kid doing dancing. I was in the debating team. I put my hand up first every time in class to speak in front of the class. So I guess I always had a fire in me to do something. Um, so anyway, YouTube came out and it was back when we had like webcams on our computer that we used to film videos. So I started um, just making these silly videos when I was in high school of myself and putting them on YouTube not for any real reason. I just thought this is going to be fun for me to do. I liked the process of doing it. And throughout high school, they would get, you know, 200 views, 300 views, 100 and something views. And it was probably just the kids at my school. But I got a little bit of a kick out of it and I just kept going with it. But you weren't trying to build a brand. No, no I was just well, why having were you fun. Doing it? Yeah, you're having fun. I was having fun. I loved setting up a camera and talking in front of it and then putting it all together and then like just uploading it on the YouTube. That was the last little bit. But I never thought anything of it at the time. I never thought that this was going to turn into a career. I think at this point in YouTube, it wasn't really people's careers yet because um, it was so fresh and new. And then it just kept growing and it was something that I just stuck with as a little hobby of mine um, throughout high school. Again, I wasn't building a brand. I was just having fun. I dropped out of high school in year 11. I only stayed um, into year 11 because all my friends did and I didn't know what I wanted to do. I, I know I, I knew I didn't want to go to uni. I wasn't interested in any of those things. So I dropped out, worked a ton of jobs um, throughout my late teens after high school and still kept making those YouTube videos and then it, it was it was growing. Can I ask you, like, uh, when you started, uh, I just want to sort of go back, how old were you when you did your very first YouTube video? I think I may have been 14 or 15. Okay, so. <laughs> I don't even know if I was old enough to be on that <laughs> platform. Yeah, right. And uh, <laughs> w w your parents had no idea? No, I think like mum knew but didn't care. It was just some little fun thing I just yeah. did in my room, just talking to myself. And what, and, and when you're, you're sitting there with your webcam on on top of your computer, so what what 
what did you say? Like, I mean, how did you, what was your, hey there. It's, hi, British yeah, it was, it was very much that just me talking absolute nonsense or. Just talking shit. Yeah. About what though? Um, Do you remember your very first one? Yeah, I think I introduced myself and said, this is me and this is the kind of videos that I'm going to make. You'll just see videos about my life. And then I was pretending that I was into makeup. Like I wasn't really into makeup, but I knew that there were some people on YouTube that were doing like the beauty tutorials and stuff. So I went to Kmart and bought a couple of eyeshadow palettes for like $3. And I said, I'll do some makeup tutorials and show things that I've bought. Like it really was just anything. I didn't have like one specific thing that I was going in going, yep, this is what I'm going to do on my YouTube channel. I just wanted people to see me. <laughs> sort of unplanned though. Yeah. So it's like, like you didn't plan out a program Mm-mm. but you, it's because sometimes people tend to plan their programs and whilst they're doing all the planning, everyone's get, getting out there and getting ahead of them. Mm-hmm. So you just decided to have a crack, just go for it. Yep. And uh, But not, not, not with a, a view or well, this is the right strategy or the right tactic. It's just that's your personality. Yep. You weren't with the personality. Yes. So you got some stuff from Kmart or wherever it is, you know, eyeshadow, whatever it is. Why did you pick makeup? Why did you pick beauty and why did you decide that explaining how to um, apply makeup might be something you can do. Did you see that on YouTube? Did you yeah, think that's I something s- I like? I saw other people doing it. Yeah. And it wasn't my passion or anything like that at the time, but I just saw other people were doing that. Or they were like going and purchasing makeup and then doing a video showing what they recently bought, which is a haul. Here's a haul of all the things I bought today. Yeah, yeah. Um, which is so vain when you really think about it. Um, but it wasn't, yeah, I just saw other people doing makeup. So I thought I'll do a bit of that. I'll do a bit of talking. I'll try to be a bit funny and do a bit of everything. Okay, humour. So you, you, you threw a bit of humour in? Yeah. Um, maybe they didn't laugh but you nonetheless threw a bit of humour <laughs> They in. probably laughed at me. Yeah, yeah. Like, But that works. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. People can laugh because at me. Because what were you what – because at the end of the day, um, I guess what you were really doing here is just providing entertainment. Yes. That's all it was. Yeah. And did you entertain yourself? Yes. I loved it. And how often did you do it? At the start when I was still in high school it was – not very often, like not even one video a week, just every now and then when I was in the mood to make something and put it out there. But uh, once I dropped out of high school and started getting um, more into it, I was a lot more consistent with it. And then I kind of would set myself goals of going, I'm going to put out one video a week. I'm going to put out one video a week. And then telling the people that were subscribing to me, I'm going to make a new video every week. I'll be back next Monday with another video. At this point, it was when there was people becoming like super famous from YouTube and you would see like at the end of the video, they'd be like, come back, I'm next Monday, Wednesday, Friday, new videos, like that kind of thing. So I guess I followed that. And then you will notice a trend with your audience then expecting your video to go up Mm. at that time. And then if you ever missed it, it would be like, where's your new video? Yeah, yeah. Because they became attached to that time frame that you would be showing up for them. That's very important. Yeah. And uh, because also that drives you to make sure you do it. Yeah, keeps yourself accountable. You become accountable. I'd be up late at night like quickly making sure I edit this video because it's got to get go up tomorrow morning. So it was good in a way as well, like accountability. Yeah, accountability is that. one of the most important things. It was, mm-hmm. I mean, like, it, it just, just, that, just in terms of edit, I mean, you, you just sort of glossed over the word edit there and uh, mm-hmm. that's not that easy. I mean, how did you learn how to edit a video? Mm, yeah, the, the more I did it, the better I got at it and then I eventually became super fast at it. Um, but again, just like using the stock standard iMovie program on my MacBook Air at the time. Yeah. Just cut and paste, chop out the shit that's boring. Yeah. <laughs> Keep yeah, in the good yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah, totally. But yeah. but how, how did you instinctive did you go on a YouTube? Um, no, no, I think to have a look? um even back into primary school, our Windows desktop computers had Windows Movie Maker back in the day. I don't know if you remember that. No. <laughs> I used to play around with that when I was a kid, just like putting little clips in there and stuff. So I think I just always had a knack, I guess, for technology in a way. I've always been a little bit savvy with it. So it was pretty easy to learn. Just yeah. click and drag and drop. <laughs> yeah, but, but I think you make everything sound ridiculously simple. It, pro- <laughs> it does take time. Yeah, of course. And, and commitment. Yes. It's probably not relevant to today, to today. But if you if someone said to you, hey, Brittany, what are like three things or maybe five things even, but – what are three things that you learned about the power of, say, something like YouTube at the time? Like, like, what have I got to do with YouTube that makes me become popular and build an audience? I think the biggest one of all is ha- having something to offer your audience, something that they can relate to, whether it's like a relatable personality 
or teaching them something or making them laugh, like just giving them something I think is the key to becoming popular online. I think for me mine was a mix of, you know, um, having a personality that my audience could relate to. I think a lot of people. What do you think that was? What do you think is your personality that the audience could relate to? I would say in a way, like a lot of people used to say like you're a bogan. So I think maybe it's just that bogan Newcastle vibe that people got from me. They could see themselves in me. I was never trying to pretend to be someone else online, which a lot of people still do now, but even more so back then when it was this YouTuber world, it was like everyone was trying to pretend to be something else to fit into an ideal of perfection online, whereas I just got on there and would just say, you know, how the fuck are you? Like just being myself and I think that is one of the reasons why my YouTube channel blew up the way that it did. So so would we put that on, under the word of authenticity? Yes, for yeah, sure. So, so audiences are looking for authenticity. I would say like another key to growing your following online and becoming popular is more so on like the editing side, like keeping your content engaging, fun, snappy, fast, you know, knowing when to delete out the boring bits because no one wants to watch a really boring video. Keep it entertaining, I yes. guess. Yes. Is part of the authenticity, you said being a new, Bogan Newcastle girl, whatever, <laughs> that's called regional. It's not called Newcastle. <laughs> Some of the people in Newcastle these days might not like that, especially if they live on the beach at, is it Hamilton or whatever? Merriweather. Merriweather, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they won't like it. But uh, who was Brittany Saunders then and can you see stages of Yeah, yourself? back then, so I quit my full-time job when I was 21. That's when I became self-employed and became a YouTuber full-time or wanted to give it a red-hot crack. What was your full-time job? Working in an office Monday to Friday. I had plenty of those jobs. I had so many jobs up until the age of 21. I was just trying to find what it was that I wanted to do in life and everything that I did, I was like, this isn't it. Like, this isn't it. I was trying to find it. Little did I know that I was destined to do something of my own. Um, and back then it's funny because I just quit my job like it was nothing and I remember telling mum and she was like, you're crazy. But I thought, what's the worst that's going to happen if this YouTube thing doesn't work out? I'll just go get another job like, like I'd always been doing. And then throughout my early 20s, that's when my social media really catapulted into something bigger than I ever could have imagined. And you never expect that to happen, I guess. Like when I think back to myself making those videos in my bedroom, like you just never think that it would become something like that. But I guess that's the beauty of the internet. And back then I really thought I knew it all. And maybe we're all like this in our early 20s, but I thought I knew it all. I thought I had it all worked out. I was this famous YouTuber and I was getting free products and getting paid by all these brands and even getting sent on trips around the world with all these brands to go to these events. And I just thought I knew exactly what I was doing in life. But reflecting on that now, as a 30-year-old, I had no idea what I was doing. No idea at all. I was so naive and clueless. And in a way, I think maybe I was even like a little bit lost and still trying to find myself in that. And it was throughout my early 20s and more towards my mid-20s that I'd been doing YouTube for a while and I realised that it wasn't everything that I wanted to do. And I always used to say that I know that this isn't forever, like YouTube isn't forever for anyone. So I guess that was the one of the biggest realisations for me now just reflecting is like I was clueless when I was doing all that, even though online it very well may have seemed that I had my life all together and I was making all these videos and doing all these cool things. I was just going along with it and had no real idea of what the next day was going to hold for me. Clueless is an interesting concept though because I think <laughs> actually think it's quite an advantage. Um, if I could just move cluelessness over to maybe naivety, mm -hmm. um, sometimes if you're naive you don't assess all the potential problems yes like you would when you would today at 30 mm -hmm. you, you look at things differently today yeah but then when you're 21 22 you're naive and and clueless i guess but <laughs> well you're just you're just not um mature and experienced not at all you're, but i thought i was worldly you're not worldly no but but when you're naive you just do it anyway someone exactly. says hey hey Brittany, you want to go to america to do this or you want to go blah 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 yeah okay it's, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm good. I'm up for it. I'm cool. Mm -hmm. And then you get a massive amount of experience out of it. Mm -hmm. And and but if you were someone who overthought these things and maybe older, you probably wouldn't do it. No. So naivety is an advantage. Yeah. Cluelessness is an advantage. And what it sort of tells me is, if you're a young person, just go with it. Yes. Just do it. 
Don't don't overthink it. Don't try and work out is this good or bad for me. It doesn't matter. Some things are good, some things are bad. I mean, I'm sure there's been experiences you had when you're 21, 22 that you thought, oh, I wish I hadn't done it in hindsight. Mm-hmm. That was a waste of time. Mm-hmm. But there was plenty where – but you, unless you sort of apply the spray technique, you won't hit a target. Mm-hmm. You won't get anything. Yeah. You know, you've got to spray everything. I, I mean, I did that. I just said yes to everything. Yeah. And uh, But only out of naivety. Yes. Because I wasn't experienced. I didn't have a parent telling me, Mark, now let's just think about this. Neither. No, neither. And I'm glad I didn't. Same. Because I don't think I would be doing what I'm doing now if I had had guidance growing up. Um, my dad wasn't in my life from 14 up and then mum was a single mum and mum kind of always had the attitude of like, do whatever you want. I don't care. I'd be like, mum, I'm not, I'm not going to school today. And she's like, see if I give a shit. <laughs> like, you know, like, <laughs> and I'm like, okay. And I think it's that growing up, not having guidance or parents that pushed me to go to uni or study in school or do well in my assignments or whatever. I think it was that, that it's the reason why I am the way that I am today. And also the way that I was like, going on this YouTube adventure and just going for it and taking a risk and putting myself out there Um, because I kind of had no hesitation doing any of those things. And I think naturally I've carried that same sort of attitude into my adult life. Obviously now I'm a little little bit more calculated with everything that I do, but I still do have that fearlessness in me and that feeling of like I can do anything if I really want to just go out there and do it. You said fearlessness and that's quite interesting. So Fearlessness doesn't mean you're reckless. Um, no. There's a big difference. Um, and uh, fearlessness with a with a with some amount of um, purpose or understanding of the outcomes is quite a powerful tool. And you don't, but you don't get that. You don't get the second part of that until you're a bit older. But fearlessness is a, a prepared to have a go, have a crack, a red hot crack mm-hmm. at anything. Yes, is really important. If you're trying to build a brand and trying to build a business in particular, but trying to build brand first, and your brand was built off effectively light entertainment and being out. <laughs> yeah, and I love this new saying that we've got, yeah, light entertainment. Light entertainment. <laughs> and being able to leverage your own TV channel. Mm. Like if I said to you, if there was no YouTube, it didn't exist, no Instagram, no LinkedIn, nothing, and I said to you, hey, Brittany, I'm going to, I own Channel 9, I'm going to put you on television every Monday night and I'm going to give you a half-hour slot and uh, yeah, get you to talk shit to your friends and what have you, you probably would have built a brand that way too um, in your case, but you can be just funny and <laughs> or just fun to be, not even funny, just fun to listen fun. to, mm-hmm. just to give me some light relief from the shit that's going on in my life. Mm-hmm. Or that could be just boredom in my life. Yeah. And maybe what you in, in the early days you're providing to your, to your other um Let's not call them bogan, but mates, <laughs> mates at school who, you know, the initial 100, 200, whatever it was, they might just be bored with the shit in their life and thought, yeah. oh, I'm just going to watch what she's got to say. Yeah. And you gave them a bit of a light relief. I mean, that's really important. Mm-hmm. You never probably understood that at the time, but no. you must sit back and think about that these days. Oh, yeah. Even today, people will come up to me. And they'll say, I've been watching you forever. And that, that thought is so crazy to me. Yeah. You know, because. You just never think that, but you could be in someone's life for a really long time and they could just love checking in to see what you're doing in your life and they watch for years and that is crazy to me and yep. amazing. So like you start off as light entertainment. Where would you say you are now? Well, now it was a, a big transition from for me going from this YouTuber that was purely just existing for entertainment Then I made a lot of money out of being on YouTube and when I was in this growth on YouTube, that's when brands were starting to um, clue on to the fact that they could pay people like me to promote their product in in a video. So then I started doing that. The first one that I ever did was with um, Colgate. They came out with their brand new optic white toothpaste, you know, the red toothpaste Colgate. I did a sponsorship for that and I think they might have paid me like $2,000 or something, which was a lot of money for me back then, like in my early 20s, I was there for kind of the rise of that in Australia, brands jumping onto it. And at the beginning, it was very much so the bigger corporate companies discovering that. Whereas nowadays, it's all about, you know, the small businesses have really jumped on the back of 
influencers and paying people to promote their products. When you say B Corp, would you mean fast moving consumer goods? Like Colgate, yeah, Coca Cola, yeah, yeah. like yeah. it was all those brands yeah. that were really the first ones doing it. And it was interesting to work with those kinds of brands because social media is such a natural organic platform and you're creating this content yourself. But then I would work with these big brands where they'd have like a million people that the script would have to go through before it would get to me. You had to get legaled. Yeah. And then I would have to make the video, send it to them. They'd have to go through all their board of directors probably to get ticked off. And then they go, no, nah, you said that line wrong. Like, do it again. And I got so sanitized. Yeah. And I'd got so frustrated with so many of these because YouTube was this fun thing for me. But then these brands would want to make it like, you may as well have just put an ad on TV and got someone, an actor to read off a script. Um, so anyway, I made a lot of money out of YouTube over the years and built my other social media platforms off the back of that getting my YouTube subscribers to go and follow me on Instagram. And that's how I built my Instagram. And then it got to a point where I'd done so many paid sponsorships from brands that I began to feel like I was flogging a dead horse. Bit of a sellout. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because I started YouTube not with the mindset of I'm going to make heaps of money out of this and work with all these brands. I started it in my room for fun. It was just a fun hobby that I had from high school. And then it turned into this money-making machine, but to do that, I then had to be not a sellout because I guess you can pick and choose who you want to work with. A brand can come to you and say, hey, do you want to promote this? And you can say, no, thanks. Like that's not interesting to me. I'm not interested in that product. But I still, even when I was promoting all these products that I did love, it just started to feel more and more not authentic. Commercialised. Yeah. Yeah. And I felt more and more, more that way throughout the years and um, even then when I started Fate, I was still doing that as well. Like that was my income stream. Fate being your clothing, brand. Yeah, clothing, clothing brand. company. Yeah. Yep. And um, it was only just up until recently, a year ago today, I gave up working with brands for money. Um, but it was probably two years prior to that that it was something that I wanted to do. And I would say to my partner, like, I, I feel like I can't do this anymore. Like it doesn't feel right and I would say it to my accountant, like, I think I want to shut down this company, Brittany Lee Saunders Proprietary Limited. And he'd be like, why? Like, you're making so much money. Like, it just didn't feel like something that I wanted to keep doing. That's a very interesting. So, I mean, I don't, because a lot of people don't never get experience this, but I mean, a lot of people see you there doing, you know, having your millions of followers and subscribers and huge audiences and, you know, going around the world and success and doing doing ads for big organisations, et cetera, and they, they get a bit oh, a bit of envy there, you know, mm. um, feel like they're um, not living the ideal life, mm. you know, your life. And um, whereas they don't realise that those things aren't necessarily ideal, it's, um, it's sort of quite an interesting phenomenon when you get to your stage and, and, and particularly at your age, um, making that big call. Um, mm mm-hmm. I'm not comfortable anymore. I'm going to go do something else. Yeah, and it's actually like a privileged thing that I could have done that because, you know, YouTube then wasn't my only revenue stream. Um, If I hadn't done other things, I would still have to keep doing that obviously because that's what was paying my bills and all that. Um, So, yeah. Was it a big deal though when you made that decision? Not really because it was something that I would thought of for so long and even when I gave it up one year ago, I'd really weeded out basically every brand and I was only working with a few. So it was really just giving up long-term partnerships that I'd been working with brands for a few years. Um, So it wasn't that big of a deal. And in saying that, I've given it up. But if something really good came my way today, I would still be open to the idea, but it would have to be something that I could really get behind or align myself with or, you know, working with a brand that would um, allow me to create some fun, engaging content around their product. I suppose being dictated to. Yeah, or just holding up a product next to my face, being like, buy this lipstick and use my discount code for 10% off. Like, I can't do that anymore. It doesn't feel genuine to me. So, you, but, you, you, but you were happy to compromise um, not having the income anymore um, in, in return for feeling comfortable. Mm-hmm. You happy with that? Yeah. Yeah. So is that because you made enough money in the past and you don't need the dough or you've got something to replace that amount of money? Um, well, is that because technically, fate? technically I'm earning less now as the CEO of Fate, but that's because I don't pay myself a ridiculous amount of money. But I'm more financially stable now with the company being there behind me, I guess. Like if it all went to shit tomorrow, I'd be pretty well set. Yeah. Um, 
And yeah, I could still be like working with brands every single day and just making so much more money, but I genuinely don't want to do that. I don't know if that's weird. And I, I told my friends who are also influencers that I wanted to give this up and they're like, you're crazy. Like this is hundreds of thousands of dollars a year that you're just giving up doing. But I just, I don't want to do it. <laughs> well, that, that sort of goes to your authenticity at the end of the day too. So let's talk about fate. Uh, your clothing brand. Mm -hmm. um, how the hell did you become a clothing brand person? Like do, <laughs> do you design your own clothing? How does yeah. it work? Yeah, we do it all ourselves in-house. Um, Fate wasn't my first stab at business. Um, throughout my late teens I got more and more into the makeup thing <laughs> after buying those palettes from Kmart and I started my own little makeup business in Newcastle where I would charge people and I'd do their makeup for an event or whatever. I think I'd charge like 40 bucks. I was ripping myself off. As in a makeup artist. Yeah, yeah. but just freelance, like, you know, not – I didn't have any qualifications or anything like that. And then I also started a uh, spray tanning business. I lived in a rental house on a slopey block that had one of those brick cold dungeon rooms under the back of the house. Scary. Sounds scary. Yeah. And then so I tried to make it really pretty and I made this at-home salon underneath there. I got the spray tanning tent. I went and bought the spray tan machine or the solution and I used just my Facebook account where I had all my friends in Newcastle on there to promote come and get a $15 spray tan by me. And it was then I didn't even realize, but I was teaching myself the fundamentals of running a business and promoting myself and, you know, creating these graphics on, I don't know what I made them on Microsoft Word. Um, it was back then that I was really teaching myself how to run a business. I didn't even know that that's what I was doing at the time. I was just like wanting to make some extra money. And then I had a little skincare business, selling coffee scrubs. At one point I was decorating iPhone cases and selling them on Facebook. <laughs> it was really bad. Um, but there was lots of things throughout my late teens and into my early 20s where I was attempting to do business without even really realising that's what I was doing. Again, like I was just a bit fearless and thought, yeah, I can buy some plain iPhone cases and stick some gems on them and sell them. Um, so when it came to fate. It was really another one of those little things that I was trying that I didn't put all that much thought into at the time, the same that I did with the makeup business and the spray tan and the coffee scrubs that I was selling. It was just another one of those things. Um, but obviously at this point in my life, I then had this audience that I had built online. So I knew that this was a bit different because I had people to market it to. I'd already built the audience and now I'm going to sell them this brand. Um, and it, again, I didn't think anything of it at the time. I didn't think two months into the future at that point in my life. It was always just about that day and what I was doing then. Um, and little did I know that fate would then catapult to be what the, like, to be what it is today. I had no idea. I remember when I, um, had to hire my first employee and I'm like 25 at the time or something and I just got like a family friend and I remember being so scared that I wasn't going to be able to afford to pay her for the hours that she was coming in and she just came in as my little assistant, you know, helping me because we set it up in my garage under my house, had a townhouse with like a double garage so we took the cars out of there and I was with my partner at this time so he was there for the start of fate. We went to Bunnings near our house. And I said, how many plastic tubs do we need? He's like, I don't know, 10. So we got 10 plastic tubs from Bunnings, like just a clear plastic tub. So we could line them up on the ground and put the stock in there and put our shipping bags in there. I got an Officeworks desk, got a shitty printer from Officeworks and I was doing it all wrong. Like the way that we were running this back in the start of fate was so wrong. But I, I think that's one of the best things about business is just looking back on how you used to do things and forever improving your methods and systems. And I just, it was in my shed. I'd wake up and I'd go downstairs and I'd pack the orders for the day. I would write back to the emails we'd gotten, you know, from customers answering their questions the Australia Post postie would come to my front door and I'd drag out the bags of clothes in the Australia Post um, big sacks and, like, that's what it was and I never thought anything of it from there. I didn't think that it was going to be anything more than that. Um, and then it's just been a really quite fast natural progression from there, the brand just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I used everything that I learned from being on YouTube for all those years and being on Instagram to then market fate, you know, I'd learn how to promote myself. So then I naturally 
thought I can also promote a business and a brand. You've now it's now got a shop. You've yeah, one, you got one shop. What, how many shops you got? I'm about to open my third one. Third shops. So it started in my garage under my house, and then so online. Yeah, online yeah. only. And then it got to a point where I could feel that we were outgrowing the garage. So I looked up commercial real estate online, found a 90 square meter tin shed basically in the industrial area in Newcastle. And at this point I was still so scared about money because I think it was maybe 35 grand a year to rent or something. And I'm like, oh, God, like, am I going to be able to afford to do this? But I thought, no, nope, I'm going to do it. And I've found in business, like it's when you have those questions and you make those decisions, even if they scare the shit out of you, like when you're asking like, can I afford this? Can I do this? That is the universe saying this is the time that you need to do it. Whenever you've got that feeling, I don't know. You need to be a bit nervous, I agree. Oh, yeah. It's got to be a bit of an edge. Yeah, 100%. Don't, don't, if you're walking in there all relaxed, it's probably not going to be of any value. Exactly. So we moved into our first 90 square metre concrete shell. 700 bucks a week. Yeah. Um, so there was that. And then it got to a point we weren't even there for a year. It was only a 12-month lease as well, so that was good. I think it had been about 10 months and we were outgrowing that again. And so, again, jumped online, commercial real estate, having a look around, and then I found this big building. It was like 500 square metres all up and it was beautiful. It was a two-storey building in a residential street, weirdly enough. Um, upstairs was this, was this beautiful New York loft looking office with like really high ceilings and brick walls. And then attached to it on the side was a warehouse where you could pack the orders. And then downstairs was what looked like a showroom. It had polished concrete floors. And then I said to my partner, AJ, I remember we went to drive past it one day and we just like put out like this up to the window and we were looking in like this. And I said, this could be a shop. And I had no clue how to run a retail store, but I said, this could be a shop. And AJ's like, oh, God, here we go again. I'm like, upstairs could be the office, downstairs could be a shop, and then we've got the warehouse on the side. Like it's all in one place. And the rent was 120 grand a year. And I was like, oh, shit. Like that's a big jump from the 30-something grand that I'm paying. And I was like, no, 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 I can't afford it, I can't afford it, I can't afford it. I sent the link to a few of my friends and I'm like, look at this place, like fate could be there and it could be a shop. And so I just sat on it for a while, didn't contact the real estate agent or anything like that. And then I went, I'd kept going back to the listing online and it was still staying there because commercial properties, they stay available for ages sometimes. Um, and then I noticed that the rent had dropped and it was a hundred grand. So they'd slice 20 grand off it. And I was like, this is my sign, like the rent has dropped. So I called up the real estate agent. Meanwhile, I'm like, I don't know how old I am at this point, 25, 26, I don't know. So I went and met this real estate agent and we went through the building and I'm acting like I haven't been there before, looking through the windows and I'm walking around like, yep, yep, we would set up a shop here. Like, But again, a bit clueless, like I don't know how to run a shop, but I was explaining what I would do in the place. And then... I left there and I was so excited. Like I was jumping up and down like, oh, my God, I really want to get this place. <laughs> as scary as it is paying 100 grand a year rent. And so we we got we got the space. So that was super exciting. We moved from the concrete shell tin shed into this big building and set up our office upstairs and set up a warehouse on the side. And then here I am Googling how to set up a retail store. Like how do I do this? Like what do I need? How do you have a point of sale system? Everything that I've learned, I've literally just been looking it up online throughout my entire career. And again, when we finally got to the point of opening up our store, I had that fear of what if people don't come? Uh, what if people come in for the first month and then it just dies off and then no one comes in anymore and then, you know. So I had a goal that if the store could make a hundred grand a year, I'd be happy. Uh, because then it would cover the rent of the whole building and then the online money could be for everything else. And so we opened the, the store and four years later we're still open in that same location and it's doing better than it ever has before. Um, and we only ever had that one store and then like because of that building, you know, and we've since moved out of there because we grew again. So we've got another big warehouse now and another office. 
Um, but when I opened that store, I never thought of expanding into other stores. I just thought it was because we had this special building that we'd have this one store in the, in Newcastle. Because have an office here, warehouse. Yeah, I didn't think that we'd then eventuate into opening more stores. Um, and so throughout the years of being there, obviously our online store has just grown and grown and grown and all throughout COVID and everything, like we were really lucky with being online. We could still run a business and our community just kept hounding, like, when are you opening the next store? Like, when is your next store? I'm like, what do you mean? Like, what? Like, we've just got this one shop in Newcastle, which is just so five minutes from us at any given time. Like, I can't open another store in another area. But eventually I just went, all right, like I'd gotten enough comments. I'm going to look into it. So then I'm Googling, how do you open a store in a Westfield? Like, I don't know how to do any of this. Started emailing a bunch of the Westfields down here in Sydney last year. And Westfield Miranda was the the first one that got back to me. So then I drove down here, had a meeting with them, figured out it's actually quite simple to set up. Um, And so, yeah, we opened the second store in November last year and it just, it went crazy. Um, So now we're doing the third one. Yeah, Yeah, there was a little bit of controversy about the Miranda one. A few people didn't particularly like it. Oh, yeah. How do you deal with that shit? Or, Or do you not bother at all? Uh, I've been online for a long time now and so I've learned in that time that no matter what you're doing online, if you're putting yourself out there, people are going to have an opinion. Yeah. But if I had ever at any point throughout my entire online career worried about what people had to say about me or let them get in my way, I'd be nowhere, you know. I, w- I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now if I had let the opinion of others affect me and I get it like words can hurt and I've had some horrible things said to me over the years but I just think I don't know anyone in my life that would ever leave a nasty comment to someone online like would you ever leave a nasty no. comment exactly I've had them yeah I don't leave them I would never leave a nasty comment to someone online my partner never would none of my friends would so it just makes me think when I see people being horrible to others online I just they're the weird ones yeah or they're a loser mm. No offense. No, but no, t- no, t- I totally agree with you. They are losers. <laughs> and, 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 and that's why they're leaving weird comments back to you. Yeah, it's just quite sad, really. And uh, like some people can be extremely horrible online. Like I know people have experienced bullying to the point where it's literally not even funny anymore, um, which is just a whole other thing. But as for me and the comments that have been thrown my way, like I just use it as fuel. Like, I had someone. Do you come back at them? Do you, do you... Sometimes or like I'll jump on my Instagram story and say, take a look at this and just laugh, you know, and then people love that, you know, snapping taking the, back. Taking yeah, the taking the piss. Yeah. And so when we open our Westfield Miranda store, which was a raging success, um, we offer like a lot of sizes that a lot of the big brands don't. Um, so we're more so a store where more people can shop. Um, so we had a few comments thrown um, around in the store of like, oh, this is a shop you know, for fat people. Um, and I, I just say like, no, like we're just a shop that anyone can come into and buy. But I think, again, that just says everything about that person yeah. and nothing about us because what we're doing is actually something amazing. Can you believe someone could be bothered actually writing that? Like have they got the time to waste to, to write something like that? Exactly of, of no right. No balance. But there's no... There's no balance. There's no advantage. There's no, just, I know they just, gain nothing from it. It's really quite sad. Other than maybe feeling as though someone's going to hear what they got to say. I, I just, I, I actually never can understand why people make comments like that. I Me mean, it's neither. not like it's like you're. It's not like they're hitting back at you because you're saying something that's controversial or unfair or even debatable. And then fair enough, if I am saying something wrong on the internet yeah, yeah. or if I'm doing something wrong and people want to call opinion. me out yeah, 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 or correct me or whatever it may be. But if it's someone just taking a stab at you for what you're doing or what you look like, like that just has no relevance at all. So is the best way to deal with that um, from your point of view is the best way to deal with that um, to analyse it and then just treat it for what it is and just move on or, yeah. or is it best to ignore it, just pretend it's not there? Or, or I would ignore it. Sometimes, like, I would reply, like, just a, a funny response or something like that. Like, someone literally messaged me the other night and said, why don't your eyebrows move when you talk? And so I sent her back a photo of me going like this. And then she got mad that I, like, <laughs> had gotten back to her. And she's like, why are you sending me this photo? I'm like, you told me that my eyebrows don't move when I talk. 
it was this back and forth. It's just funny and entertaining. But most of the time I don't entertain it. Like just delete it. <laughs> Block <laughs> like, what, and just move what, on with your life. Where to from here? What are, what other projects you got on? Like um, because I, I'm, not, I'm sure you're not someone who's going to sit around and do nothing more, just keep like, I've got three shops I'm happy about. And no, like, I think one of the most fascinating things about business is there is no end to it. I don't, I'm sure you feel the same. Mm. And it's interesting being in business because you almost get this feeling of never being really satisfied because you never reach the end. Like it, it just is infinite. You can keep going forever and ever. And I've been saying to myself a lot lately that I want to stop and try to enjoy where I'm at in my journey rather than always focusing on what's the next big thing that I'm going to do. But when you've got that fire in your belly, you just always want to keep going and do the next thing, you know, and maybe that's why I'm opening all these stores to like fill this void. But it, because it, it, but it is a bit of a rush and uh, it can be an addiction. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you think you're sort of at that point or you're saying to yourself, because your YouTube thing, you're able to stop that addiction. Yeah. Because that, that's, that's an addiction. Yeah. Getting hit up with money, you're increasing your subscriptions, you know, like everyone's tapping you on the back saying, wow, how good is this, blah, blah, blah. But you're able to close that one off and go on to what you're doing now. Mm-hmm. Do you think that um, the addiction of business and success around business mm-hmm. and also the, you know, the, the rush of doing new things, like mm-hmm. trying new shit out. Like, I mean, I've seen you on Instagram painting your fit out, doing your fit out at Miranda. I think it was Miranda, you know, like went on for weeks, you know, all the stuff you're doing, you're in your overalls and stuff like that. Um, that that's part of the addiction. Mm-hmm. Can you manage that? Yeah. Yeah. Do you think that was, so do you think that, because there's nothing wrong with saying finished, I'm not doing that anymore. I'm going to settle down, marry my bloke. I always say to AJ sometimes when we're laying in bed at night, you know, tomorrow I could just wake up and go, I've had enough of all this. That's what I'm saying. I could say, sorry, girls, you've all lost your job. Like I've had enough of this. But I I don't think I will, not anytime soon because obviously I'm working very hard and doing a lot of work, but I wake up every day and I'm so excited to go to work. And I never had that feeling when I had a job, you know, previously. Um, I just absolutely love what I do. Like we just have so much fun. I love everything that we're doing as a brand. We're opening up stores and we're opening them we're opening them up. Obviously, we're gonna make a lot of money out of them, but we're also opening them up because our community is asking for it. They're wanting our stores um in their city. They're wanting to be able to come in and try things on. Like a lot of people still love that in-person connection in store. And a lot of people say, like, retail's dead, but Mm. I'm proving that it's not. Like if you're doing it right and offering an amazing experience, product, a connection between your brand and the consumer, they, they love it. Like they can't wait for the next store to open. So I think what's next for us is continuing to grow. Like we're in a massive growth period right now. So hopefully, you know, rolling out more stores. Um, just I'm trying to just put us in major cities for now on the East Coast. People are saying, come to Perth. And I'm like, oh, my God, how? What if the whole team calls in sick on one Saturday morning and I'm in Newcastle? You want me to get to Perth? I'll be there tomorrow. Um, So for me, yeah, just growing fate is um, what I plan to do for now, where it's going to take us. I have no idea, but I think that's the beauty of it. And this guy really is the absolute limit in my eyes. And I feel fearless. And unstoppable. Um, so I'm just going to keep rolling with that while I've got this confidence. <laughs> well, that, that is, that's a pretty cool thing to be, to be in that in that um, phase of your life where you still feel fearless and unstoppable. But Do you feel fearless and unstoppable? Oh, I've probably got too much, too many experiences in my life now because I know what, the things that can go wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, uh, I'm I'm definitely stoppable but I'm not going to stop. Yep. That's the difference. Yeah. I mean I, I, I have no intention to stop because for me it's never ending until it, I, I, it only ends when I'm dead. And uh, that does. Yeah. For me, it ends when I'm dead. I don't have any intention whatsoever of retiring mm-hmm. because to me, then I'm dead. Uh, that's that's why I look at it. Mm-hmm. But I, but I, but equally, I don't find myself. I don't view myself as being unstoppable because as I've been through too many ups and downs. You've in, done a lot in my years. <laughs> but but uh, but that mean, doesn't mean I stop. Anyone can do anything. I've proven if that to myself. Themselves. I've proven that to myself that I can do anything. It all started from my bedroom yeah. making YouTube videos. And you believe in yourself. Yes. And I, I back I, myself 100%. And I think that's the biggest lesson for me out of this podcast today. No matter what your situation, whether you're lucky that you have parents who can do stuff for you mm-hmm. or you're not so lucky and, um, you know, 
you don't have those opportunities. If you back yourself, you're going to be really good at what you do mm-hmm. no I matter think it's what. A, it's a mentality. Yeah. Your mentality is your reality. I'm not into all that kind of stuff really. I'm not very spiritual or anything like that, but I do believe that the way that you think is the way that your life is going to be. I'm genuinely always really positive and I've realised that by me being positive in that way and thinking about all these amazing things, amazing things just keep happening in my life. Yes. So I'm just going to keep riding that wave. That's really interesting because, you know, many years ago they used to have this whole thought process of abundance, um, think, of, think of abundance, mm-hmm. you know, the positive thinking and all that sort of stuff, but think abundantly and, um, and you'll live an abundant life. Um, and you just sort of said exactly that. Mm. It's not for everybody, by the way. It, it is a lot to do with your personality. Yeah. You're lucky that's your personality. Yeah, definitely. Some people don't have the um, neurological circuits to think that way. Yeah. You're I'm very, born a certain yeah, way. Yeah, I'm very grateful that I have like my personality and the way that I think. And people are like, how do you be this way? I'm like, I have no idea. I think this is just in my DNA. I have a personality built to do what I'm doing. But I think it's Brittany Saunders' story about herself. We build a story about ourselves, and mm-hmm. we keep affirming it by living the story. Mm-hmm. So, you know, every time you did a YouTube thing and someone said you got another 100 followers or another 100 people who liked it or whatever the case may be engaged with you, that started to affirm the story about yourself. You didn't know it consciously but subconsciously you're building this neurological story about yourself mm-hmm. and that's who you are today. And, uh, you know, that's a big it's a big lesson for parents, um, you know. Try and build this resilience in your kid's brain about their ability to believe in himself, mm-hmm. no matter what your circumstances are, whether and you as, as you have as much obligation if you're a rich parent, or if you're a poor parent mm-hmm. in relation to your kid, because a lot of rich people don't do this with the kids either. Mm. They give them fucking nothing. They think they give them everything, but they give them nothing. Yeah. The most important thing is you've got to give kids sort of not literally but wings, mm-hmm. so that they can fly. And you do that by making sure you help them build the resilience you've got in your brain, your belief about yourself. Mm-hmm. And that's that's the coolest thing. And don't worry if they're naive. No. <laughs> don't worry if they're clueless. That's a good thing. Just that, go in, go for it. it and, it. and it works. If it fucks up, then fix it. Like, totally. While you're still moving forward. Yeah, and I, I, I call that like backfilling. So you just go out. And backfill whatever mess you leave behind exactly you. Exactly right. There's going to be mess. There will be mess, by the way. Oh, nothing. I don't care for shit how good you are. No. There will be mess. You're always going to make massive mistakes. you just got to keep moving forward though. Like nothing in life is ever perfect, obviously, but even in a business, like you're going to make mistakes. There's going to be things that you wish you did differently or things that are going to cost you a shit ton of money where you've done something wrong. But I think it's all about just having the mindset of, coming up with a solution and just keep on moving forward. I feel like when people run into failures in their life, they may see them as a setback and then that's when they stop and they're like, oh, shit, like hang on a second and then they can like allow that to set them back in their journey whereas I think you really just have to still keep moving forward no matter how rough and messy things can get sometimes. That is just take the next step. Mm-hmm. Don't pause. No. Take the next step. Yep. Still keep going. <laughs> Brittany Saunders, that's been so cool to talk to you finally yeah. in person. I really enjoyed it. You've energised me and oh, um, <laughs> you're killing it too and, and good luck Thank to you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for having me.